So we're going to try to talk about life in less than two hours, actually, from a Christian point of view. Now, what am I going to try to talk about tonight? So a number of things that connect with each other. Christianity, earthly life, human happiness, and how all of these things relate to a Christian vision of how one should live, how one should seek happiness in this life. Um, and this is, of course, central to Christianity because a, an ethical vision is at the center of Christianity. Um, it's not just a belief about the way things are, but it's also a religion about how we should live and how that relates to happiness and how it relates to our understanding of human life. Uh, and so one of the... I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit here at the beginning to kind of orient you with some background issues. And then we're just going to be looking at uh, some various works of Christian art that somehow get at these kind of questions. And I won't try to do too much of the theoretical parts of it, but to let the art speak for itself uh, of what it says about life, happiness, and Christian ethics. But, but one of the background questions to have in mind that is something that is a question among Christians, it's among those who aren't Christian, looking at Christianity, and that's a question you could sum up is, is God pro-fun? Is he pro-happiness? And if he is, how can it be reconciled with some of Christianity's difficult, challenging teachings? How do these things fit together? So the, the picture that was on the, on the opening screen here is something that just from a distance, without some background, could seem kind of an odd thing for, to have for this particular lecture. This is a, a painting by Van Gogh titled Still Life with Bible. And to fully appreciate this painting, a little bit about Van Gogh's background. Van Gogh's father was a Protestant reform minister, and Van Gogh himself started to study to be a minister, but then he left, in part because of his, his own struggles with some of the Christian teachings that, that at that seminary, and also with his own family. He was, he was close to his father and his mother, but uh, Van Gogh could never get them to be as open to things like contemporary literature, his love of nature, and other things. And so, while Van Gogh remained deeply religious throughout his life, deeply spiritual, as a, as a young adult, he stopped attending a church. And in this painting, you have the Bible. With this painting, also another important background, is that he painted this about six months after his father died. And the candle here has just been blown out, perhaps alluding to his father. And here, this book here, which is well-worn, folded because it's been read so often, is Emile Zola's La Joie de Vie, The Joy of Life. And so you see the Bible there, clean, pristine, open, perhaps not read much. And then in the corner there, his copy of Emile Zola's The Joy of Life. And now, this contrast isn't so kind of uh, obvious because Emile Zola's book on the joy of life is actually a tragic story of people facing all kinds of tragedy and suffering. So the title is kind of ironic. But we know from, from letters that uh, Van Gogh wrote to his sister that, uh, that he, what he liked about the book was how it was looking at life in all its reality. We also know that from his writings that one of his kind of his mixed feelings about scripture was, on the one hand, he said it was filled with all these stories, especially in the Old Testament, of human pettiness. And yet there was this core at it of Christ, which he saw as its, this, its great fruit. So this, this painting, in many ways, is kind of what this lecture is addressing, this complicated uh, picture and all that it means in Van Gogh's kind of his own conflicted way of looking at all these different things. How do we, in a sense, address Van Gogh's questioning? What is Christianity? How does it relate to the joy of life? How do these things fit together? 
So first, as a, as a little background, just to say there are, there are many different traditions of Christian ethics. And they share many similarities. They're all rooted in the Old Testament, especially the Ten Commandments, and also Christ's teachings, especially in the Gospels. They also share a belief that there's a need for faith and God's grace in living out the Christian life. But they also share many differences. Um, they have diff many different approaches on the relationship between God's commandments and earthly happiness. They also have differences about understanding who we are and how we've been wounded by sin. And also especially, what is our potential for goodness? How much potential is there within us for our de desires, our emotions to be shaped by God's grace, by our own actions? And when I say that, the, by the way, when I say there's different traditions, I'm not necessarily talking about individual moral questions. I'm just saying kind of big picture, how do you look at life? How, how do you think about Christian teachings? And there are many different uh, traditions in this question. And one of the central questions that figures into these different traditions is, what exactly is the place of law and commandment in Christian ethics? Various Christian traditions agree that obeying uh, God's law is good, earthly happiness is good, keeping God's commandments has a strong connection to happiness, and also that Christians find salvation not so much by keeping the law in all its details, but by living their lives in faith, by trying to serve God, knowing that uh, all are sinners and that we all have need for God's mercy. They all agree on that, on these questions of law, commandment, and ethics. But then there's deep questions of why is it good to keep the law? Is there a necessary link to human happiness in obeying the law? Or is keeping the law good simply because it's the law, simply because God has made the law and it fits with the order of the world and whatever the connection between happiness, obeying the law is good in itself. And the kind of the, the strongest case for a law-centric Christian ethics is that, uh, first of all, just kind of the fact that uh, obeying God's law often leads to great suffering. In the Christian tradition, that's most vividly displayed by, first of all, the life of Christ himself and the life of Christians who are killed for their faith for one reason or another. So there is an example of how obeying God's law clearly leads to great suffering. And since it follows that you know, when choosing between obeying God and avoiding suffering, Christians must always choose to obey. So therefore, it follows from all this that earthly happiness cannot be a key reference to, as a guide for kind of a big picture for the Christian life. And so therefore, however these things are related, law, happiness, the Christian life, keeping the law is good simply because God made the world, he structured it, and he is the highest moral authority. So that's one kind of strand within Christian ethical traditions. Um, another kind of important strand is a kind of a happiness-centric ethics. And in the basic premise of this approach is that God does not command for the sake of testing obedience. God commands to point us to what leads to happiness to what leads to the greatest uh, um, happiness and life. There's a line from a second century Christian thinker, Irenaeus, uh, where he says, the glory of God is man fully alive. That all the commands, in a sense, are pointed to pointing us towards what makes us fully alive. And um, this, this same theme is picked up with people like Thomas Aquinas, who says, God is not offended by us except when we act against our own good. Or it could be put otherwise, that whenever we sin, we're always sinning against the deepest desires of our own heart. Um, 
Now, still, so what does this tradition have to say about the problem of obeying the law often leads to obvious suffering and difficulties and sacrifice? And to respond to that, this approach tends to want to make a distinction between different kinds of happiness, different kinds of good feeling. Some good feelings that are kind of generic and that are good feelings, but somehow are not as deep and fulfilling as another kind, often called in English joy, something that goes beyond good feelings, that goes beyond, you know, for example, dogs can be happy, but dogs don't feel joy. And so this approach will tend to want to say that in order to think about how Christian ethics and divine commands lead to happiness, you have to take into account an issue of deeper kinds of emotions and that, there's, it, that they're not on the same plane. Okay, so that's all I really want to say as background. Uh, and then we're just going to start to move through different topics, different themes within the Christian tradition and ethics that, in one way or another, bear on these kind of issues. Or just give a fuller, uh, fill out Christian vision. And I'll just, so that you're not wondering, this is the, my own personal views are, this is the, the, the right way to approach Christian ethics. And incidentally, um, at the end of next month, uh, I and a, a Buddhist scholar from Hong Kong University will be having an, uh, an ethical dialogue, religious dialogue, Catholic and Buddhist ethics, and centered on the issue of happiness and how happiness relates to ethics. And we're, we're both in basic agreement on that question, so it's going to be interesting. Okay, so the story of Abraham and Isaac. And this I bring out as illustration of the place of faith in the Christian life and, in a sense, the radical side of the Christian life. So the story of Abraham and Isaac goes back to Genesis, and God puts Abraham to the test. Uh, he calls to him, Abraham, ready, he replied. And then God says, take your son Isaac, your only one, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him up as a holocaust, as a sacrifice, a burnt offering. You're going to kill him and burn him on a height that I will point out to you. Now, as, and so Abraham goes there, he takes his son, and he, you know, he loads him up with wood on his back, takes him to the top of the hill, which is in rabbinic tradition identified with Jerusalem and the, um, the place where the temple was. But at the last minute, God says, sends an angel, don't do it. I now see that you're faithful and um, you've passed. And this uh, story has been depicted throughout Christian history to some of the earliest uh, depictions. This we looked at earlier. This is from the catacombs. Here is Abraham and Isaac. I, uh, Abraham's got his knife in his hand. He's ready to kill his son. And last minute, uh, God comes. And you see Abraham looking off at the hand, which we can't see, to tell him, stop. This is a... Uh, from an early Christian sarcophagus. And here is Abraham, his son Isaac. There's the, the angel who's come to tell him stop. And as part of the story, uh, just as the angel stops, he, Abraham finds uh, a ram with his horns caught in the bushes. And so Abraham goes and takes the ram and sacrifices the ram instead. Now, so far, you know, in these, you know, you see it's, there's a, the story itself is dramatic and it's capturing a moment of drama. But for, especially for the, these earliest depictions, what's most important is the fact that the Christians saw this story as fulfilled in Jesus, who the Father offers in Jerusalem, and that just as Isaac had carried wood on his back for the fire to his, you know, helping with his own execution. So Christ carries wood on his back to his place of execution. Only 
in Christ's case, the sacrifice goes forward. So for them, this was an important story, but it was a prophetic story that was being fulfilled. And now we're moving ahead to the Middle Ages. Uh, these are mosaics in Sicily in the Cathedral of Monreale. And here is Abraham, again, about to sacrifice his son. The angel comes. And there's the ram caught in the bushes, waiting to be the replacement sacrifice. But up through now, still, the focus is more on, this is a story of faith. It's also a story that's important because of the way it's fulfilled in Jesus. This is another one done right around the same time in nearby Palermo, in the Palatine Chapel. And this one's got a little touch. He's got a blindfold, make it a little easier, or worse. If you're going to be sacrificed, would you want a blindfold? I'm not sure. Um, but uh, starting towards the late Middle Ages, the, the whole story of, of Abraham and Isaac starts to be wrestled over in the universities in academic theology with questions of the foundations of ethics, where people start to say, wait a second, how is this morally good to kill your own son? And how is it that God can ask Abraham to kill his own son? Yes, okay, so he doesn't have to do it at the end. But he still asked. Abraham still got ready to do it. And so people really kind of wrestle with this. I should say Christians and Jews have wrestled with the morality of this story. You know, how is this right for God to ask? But it really becomes intense in the Middle Ages. And people start to even say, um, what if God were to command us to commit adultery? Would it be good? What if God were com to command us to hate him? Should we hate him? You know, so it gets to caught up in these very theoretical questions, which starts to push people to think more and more in terms of, of law as something absolute, disconnected from what's good, from what's wise. The, the theme continues in the Renaissance period, there was a contest to design, two, uh, uh, see, uh, to design something for a wall, uh, for a, a door in Florence. Uh, they were asked to do this scene, two of them, Brunelleschi and Gilberti. And so this is Brunelleschi's version of the sacrifice of Isaac. This is Gilberti's up there, the sacrifice. Down here, another story from Abraham when he welcomes three angels. Who do you think won? All who think that Gilberti won, raise your hand. How many think Brunelleschi won? Well, not that many people voted, but it was, it was Gilberti who won. His prize was he got to carve all of the panels of the door. It took him 20 years. So he won. Um, <laughs> This is another uh, Renaissance depiction of it. This is Titian. It's starting to become more dramatic. And the story of Abraham and Isaac, this is Caravaggio, starts to become more interested in the existential story of Abraham being asked to sacrifice his son. Here, Caravaggio's had to deal with Isaac's calling out. You know, he's crying out. This is Rembrandt caught at the very moment, you know, he's dropping, he's dropping the knife. This is a more modern depiction, 1800s, a little more quiet, it's kind of taken another direction. And just to give you a sense, this is a Jewish depiction, because this is an important theme for, for Jews as well. And Mark Chagall, 20th century Jewish artist, who depicts a parallel with Christ in the background, even though he's Jewish, he appreciates the parallel. Now, one of the things that goes in this later intellectually reflection on this story ends up being those like Kierkegaard, who center their whole way of thinking about the Christian life in terms of this story, that the Christian life is about a radical call that goes against everything we know, that goes against our normal sense of what's right and what's wrong, and that this, the call of the Christian is to embrace that radical difference, that radical going against everything. Um, whereas other thinkers like 
Thomas Aquinas, had struggled to see how do you put these things together. So he'd say, well, why is it okay? Because Thomas Aquinas doesn't want to say that tomorrow everything could change. And tomorrow we go from loving God to hating God. So Thomas Aquinas said, well, a simple reason why this is okay, because, because of sin, we all deserve to die. And God has just moved up the date for Isaac. That's all that's happening. But, they st but there is a strong trend to somehow take this, either you kind of balanced it, you struggled with it, or you take it as a radical point of departure. Now, with developments in how Christians and Jews read the Bible with more attentiveness to historical and literary context, there's now a strong tradition of simply saying, no, this was a story. You don't have to think about um, this actually happening and what this means for the foundations of ethics. Um, and it's brought out that one of the purposes of this story in its historical context was to say no to child sacrifice because at the time child sacrifice was common. And so this story is saying God doesn't want it. So, and that approach, which I myself am sympathetic to, um, kind of takes that tension off the table. But it, it's important to say that this story in itself and wrestling with how is this possible for God to ask somebody to kill their son had deep uh, connections to how Christians thought about the place of commandment and law and the radicality of the Christian life. Now, it's certainly the case that the story captures something about the radicality of faith, of going beyond what seems normal, which is an important part of Jewish and Christian understanding. But the story does end with a happy ending. It fits together. And it ends up not being as radically challenging as it might seem to be. But anyways, that's, that's one piece of the, of the picture. But then there's more kind of ordinary parts of the Christian life. And a very important part of Christian life from the beginning uh, was celebrating banquets. They were joined to Christian worship. These are scenes from the catacombs we saw before. And people disagree. Are these uh, depictions of the Eucharist? Are these depictions of just a banquet, a fellowship? Are these heaven, people sharing a feast in heaven? And they could be all of them at the same time. And the key thing is that this element of feasting and celebration and enjoying life, enjoying friendship, fellowship, has been part of the Christian vision of life from the beginning. Things that Christians have in common with most other religious traditions. Now, another tradition has to do with an aspect is temptation. Now, I've put this cross here to remind those of you who remember the lecture on crucifixion. We looked at this crucifixion, and it's something that you unfold, and if you, once you kind of open it up all the way, you get to a picture of St. Anthony and the temptation of St. Anthony. And St. Anthony was a figure who's often depicted in medieval and Renaissance art as a uh, a way to talk about inner temptation and torment. St. Anthony was, a, was one of the, the first Christians to go out into the desert to live a life dedicated to prayer. And uh, he's known as the father of Christian monasticism. So he spent 20 years in the desert by himself fighting his inner demons, finding peace in the desert until people started to come to him and, and look because they wanted to live like he did. And so this is a depiction uh, by Grunewald of, in parallel to Christ's suffering, St. Anthony's suffering. And he's depicting uh, like the various spiritual torments that he's facing in terms of these monstrous, fantastical demons beating him up. Uh, another figure known one of these most things he's most famous for is his depictions of the temptations of St. Anthony. And in many and, and these, this theme is getting at this element of the Christian life, which sees a need for self-discipline, for restraint, for growing in virtue, for, for holding fast. And it's important in, in English to know that in English, temptation 
often has a sense of, of like something you desire, but is not good for you for one reason or another. But temptation, in the broader sense, wasn't just you know, being tempted by something you desire. It could be tempted by difficulties, to give up or to despair, to you know, lose heart. So here is uh, 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 St. Anthony. This is, this is actually one of Bosch's least strange depictions of St. Anthony. If you look down here, you've got a fish that's kind of walking. You've got somebody who's got a funnel over their head. Um, and you've got these strange kind of demon creatures. One of them's got a tongue in his mouth. And there's St. Anthony just kind of ignoring them, peacefully going, picking up some water. But uh, St. Anthony doesn't have it always so easy in Bosch's paintings. It, Bosch's paintings in his lifetime were famous and they were often copied because they were unusual even at the time. It's kind of so strange and vivid. And this is his biggest and most uh, elaborate of them, the, of the Temptations of St. Anthony. With St. Anthony has a, you know, appears multiple times. It's like putting all into one place various temptations and strange scenes. So here's on the left, and up here is St. Anthony flying through the sky, dragged there by demons who are flying fishes with teeth, wolves. He's lying on some kind of giant frog creature. And then he falls, and he has to be carried by some people. There's, and there's, there's lots of very strange details in these paintings. So in the middle, there is some kind of revelry, revelry going on. And over here, a strange kind of pig figure is celebrating a satanic ritual where St. Anthony is looking out, his hand in blessing, and he's pointing into a chapel. And there is Christ pointing to a crucifix on the inside. And then over here, first of all, up here, there's a nice little detail of a witch and somebody f flying through the sky on a fish. Why not? And over here is St. Anthony holding firm while a woman tempts him from behind this curtain. And over here, three humanoid demons hold up a table where there's food and wine for him. This is... Um, a more peaceful St. Anthony. Um, there's still kind of these kind of strange little demon creatures walking around. But it's like, this is like an older St. Anthony. He's kind of made it through. The demons are bothering him less now, a little more peaceful. This is a, uh, another take on the temptation of St. Anthony done in the 1800s. Bosch is the 1500s. Um, and this is the temptation of St. Anthony, a more kind of spiritualized, cognitive uh, version. Kind of, that really kind of brings the focus on what is going on inside him. And there he is, kind of holding firm, standing tall. This is my favorite. This is St. Anthony tempted by gold. So there's this big block of gold, and St. Anthony is running away. Uh, maybe you think there would be kind of like a horror film. St. Anthony and the Block of Gold. <laughs> so that's, these kind of capture that element, that one, one, one side of Christian life. This one is a story, a medieval uh, image of uh, St. Benedict, who has a different kind of temptation than we saw with St. Anthony. So it's Easter Sunday, a day when there should be no fasting. And St. Benedict had made arrangements for this monk, because he's in a hermit. He, you know, he's in a cave by himself. He doesn't want to be disturbed. But it's important that on Easter he feasts. It's a day of celebration. So he's arranged for a monk, friend of his, to come by and drop down his Easter meal. But the devil doesn't like it. He wants to make... St. Benedict's sin by not feasting on Easter Sunday and that he'll fast on Easter Sunday. So the devil comes along and steals the Easter food. 
But fortunately, all is not lost. A fellow hermit has a vision. Danger. St. Benedict had his Easter meal stolen from him. So he comes to share his Easter, his Easter food with St. Benedict. So danger averted. And uh, there's a, a series of paintings done by Peter Bruegel and also his son, Peter Bruegel II, of various feasting scenes that capture life in Flanders in the 1500s. This is a, uh, a wedding banquet. This is a, uh, a wedding dance. And over here, it's called the, the bride's dance, dance of the bride. And here in the middle is the bride dancing with her father. This is done by his son. It was very popular. He, uh, re it was so popular, he made a number of copies of it. And this is um, the feast uh, the, the feast on uh, the feast on the or the fair on the feast of Saint Hubert and Saint Anthony, and so in this one scene you've got this kind of very kind of celebratory and religious things brought together. So here there's a play that people are gathering around, and apparently people can tell from the various uh, things about the play exactly what play it was. It was a common play that was done. And you know you have people dancing over here, people eating and drinking over here. It's hard to see the detail, but over here, you've got a religious procession with statues of the two saints being carried in. Um, over here, you've got uh, two monks who are traveling through, and uh, somebody is greeting them, taking off his hat as a sign of respect, and giving them directions. Over here, people are ringing the bell. So there are lots of uh, both religious and secular things hand in hand. This is another similar scene. This was painted by the older one, Peter Bruegel Sr. And it is the, uh, called the battle between Carnival and Lent. So this is the day before Lent, the series, the time of fasting before Easter begins. And right before it, there's the big celebration of Fat Tuesday, or Mardi Gras, or Carnival. And so this is kind of at that transition period, maybe early Wednesday morning. And there's a kind of, which is apparently something that was frequently done, a kind of a mock battle here. So over here is Carnival, this large man on top of a beer uh, barrel of some kind, um, kind of have with a kind of lance with a pig on it. And then over here is Lent, kind of charging as though they're about to duel. Over here you've got um, some kind of play going on. Um, and inside here, church, uh, procession, um, dancing over here. So side by side, these two things. This is a famous painting by Georges Millet uh, of farmers in France bowing their head to pray the Angelus, a traditional prayer that's said in the morning, at noontime, and at twilight. And so here they are pausing in their work. They've heard the bell toll in the distance, and they're pausing to pray. This here is called the, the, uh, the blessing of the wheat. So it's a, a, at a time of harvest uh, or planting. It looks like harvest, but I'm not, I'm not sure what time of year. There is a procession, and the wheat is being blessed. The local farmers have turned out for this religious procession and then a blessing. Okay. So those some some thoughts about feast and fasting in the Christian life. And then um, we come to some distinctive elements of Christian ethics, things that are distinctively Christian, 
vis-a-vis -vis other traditions. So one of the stories of, of, uh, in the Gospels is the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, somebody who's waylaid by robbers, and the Good Samaritan, even though he's not a Jew, takes care of him, brings him to an inn. So here's the story. You know, here he is setting off, all looking kind of clean and dapper, and now people set upon him. The Good Samaritan finds him. He's now got a bandage on his head, takes him to an inn, and gets him taken care of. There's another manuscript, and here's the Good Samaritan. You might recognize him. That's Jesus. It was typical for Christians to say a deeper meaning of the Good Samaritan is that Jesus is the ultimate Good Samaritan who comes by, sees that humanity is wounded, and you know, takes care of him. This is a more uh, uh, is a Renaissance depiction. Oil is being poured on his wounds. This is Rembrandt, just a drawing, but very evocative. It's a, a 19th century depiction. And this is Van Gogh, uh, after a painting by Delacroix. Now, one of the reasons why I bring up the Good Samaritan is because actually this story is not as distinctively Christian as it's often thought. One of the things that's often misunderstood about Jesus' teaching um, is that it's set against Jewish teaching. In later Christian tradition, often Christian teaching is opposed to Jewish teaching, and especially Jewish teaching about the law is depicted as though uh, for Jews, there's a very legalistic understanding of law and how it works. And that's a depiction that, first of all, isn't true to the Old Testament or to Jewish tradition. And it's something that Jews find very offensive because it's not how they understand their law. Uh, just as, uh, yes, especially the time of Jesus, some of the people he, he dealt with uh, among fellow Jews had a very kind of legalistic approach to morality. But it's true also that many Christians have a legalistic attitude toward morality. So it, when Jesus, and what sets off the whole story of the Good Samaritan, is somebody asks him, you know, what, what commandments, you know, do I need, love your neighbor as yourself? A command of the Jewish law. And then, Jesus, and then they ask, well, who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells this story to say, your neighbor is everyone. And, but the point is that the whole story is a reflection on Jewish law. This is not a radical change from uh, the kind of the warm-hearted aspect of Jewish law and how, it's, uh, it, how it functions and, and how it, it's lived. But to get to kind of more distinctive uh, elements of Christian teaching, first of all, one of the most important things is something Jesus says during the Last Supper. So he's, uh, you know, they've, they've had the Eucharist, uh, you know, bread and wine have been distributed, and then Jesus washes the feet of his apostles. Uh, so there's the, the meal, and there he is washing their feet. And you see people, in this, they've got their hands up, kind of amazed that their master is washing their feet. Um, here, Peter, uh, this is Giotto from the Arena Chapel. And Jesus is, you know, is making it clear to, you know, Peter is, why are you doing this? And Jesus is saying, I'm doing it. And after Peter first said, no, you, you can't wash my feet, Jesus says, if, you don't, if I don't wash your feet, you can have no part in me. And then Peter says, well, if, if that's the case, then wash my hands and my, and my head as well. And so in artistic depictions, you'll often have Peter touching his, his head, his hand, to say, you know, wash these as well. Now, after he washes their feet, he says, this is a more contemporary one, he says to them, uh, do you understand what I've done for you? If I, your master, wash your feet, you must wash each other's feet. And he says, as, and I give you a new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. So it's not love your neighbor as yourself. It is love each other as I have loved you. So that's new. 
it's distinctively Christian because it's rooted in Christ's own action, his own life. So that's one distinctive element of Christian ethics. Another has to do with care for the poor. So in, in, uh, for the early Christians, for, and for the first few centuries and more, two stories in the Gospels had a pivotal role in Christian ethics. First, there's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Jesus says there was a rich man who had a leper at his gate, uh, who's poor. The rich man didn't give him any scraps from his table. The rich man eats well every day. But when they die, there's the, you know, Lazarus outside. When they die, there's his soul coming out of his mouth. You were wondering how it happens. That it comes out your mouth in a little body shape. Angels come, and there he is with Abraham. And then down here, not so happy scenario for the rich man, he ends up in a place of torment. And, um, and he pleads, he sees uh, Lazarus, and he says, Abraham, send Lazarus to put just a bit of water on my tongue. I'm in, I'm in torment here. And Abraham says, you had good things in your life. Now Lazarus is comforted, and uh, there's no way to, to cross this divide. And here's a little kind of close-up on each of those scenes. And this um, ended up being a critical point that often appears in Christian teaching, Christian homilies of the first few centuries as a reason why it's important to take care of the poor. But even more important than that was the story in Matthew's Gospel of the Last Judgment, where Jesus says that you know, on the last day, the Son of Man will return um, and he will gather the, the sheep on his right side, he's extending his hand, and the goats on the left. And to the sheep he will say, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, and so on. And he says, whenever you did that, you did it to me. And the reverse to those on the other side. And uh, here is an angel. This appears to be the earliest depiction of the devil in Christian art, a blue angel. Kind of cool looking, but that ended up being the basis for uh, lots of, uh, of motivation and reflection for Christians to go and minister to the needs of the poor. Uh, the, and this, in time, got developed into a traditional notion of the seven works of mercy. And this is a um, a Flemish depiction of the seven works of mercy. This is, it's all kind of one big altarpiece and one for each work of mercy. And so here's the first one, uh, feeding the poor. Um, now, this is also like, a, this is a medieval Where's Waldo as well. Because in each of these little depictions, you'll see Jesus somewhere. So here are the people lining up. Oh, there's Jesus, also in line, because when the poor have been served, so Christ has been served. So here's giving uh, drink to the thirsty. And there's Christ in line as well. Um, clothing the naked. Although I guess clothing the clothes in this case. And here's Jesus in the background. Now this is one that got added in the tradition, burying the dead. Because actually there are six things that Jesus says, and they all apply to the living. But burying the dead in Jewish custom was an especially important thing, work of mercy. And this gets picked up in the Christian tradition. And so um, here, that work of mercy is being done here. Here, Jesus is above. Um, this one is welcoming the stranger. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. So here are people being welcomed. 
And there's Jesus in line as well. Um, uh, visiting the sick, caring for the sick. Now where's, oh, there's Jesus over there, waiting in line. And visiting those in prison. So there at the back is Jesus. And this is another place uh, that this got picked up. This is in Florence, in a, in a hospital there. De La Robbia did a freeze dedicated to the seven works of mercy outside the hospital. I was thinking that in Florence, if they had had public restrooms, they probably would have had art on them. Just everything gets fantastic Renaissance art. So here is um, the pilgrims. Are, the welcoming the stranger often gets interpreted as welcoming pilgrims. And so these are pilgrim strangers, and they're being welcomed. Their feet are being washed as they come in. And here is um, attending to the sick. This is all terracotta frieze that's then painted. This is Caravaggio, the seven works of mercy. Uh, originally, they'd asked for you know, multi each seven different ones, but Caravaggio said, I'm going to do it all in one. And he's very economical. He combines multiple works of mercy at the same time. One of the strangest here is a woman breastfeeding an old man, which goes back to a Roman story of a woman whose father gets imprisoned, and he's sentenced to death by starvation. So she goes to visit him, and feeds him with breast milk, the way she could kind of sneak in to see him. So that's two works of mercy, done. Over here, <laughs> burying the dead. And there are the feet, all you see is the feet. And then here is um, uh, St. Martin of Tours, who was famous. He was a soldier, he later became a bishop, but at the time he was a soldier, and he passes a beggar and who's, who's naked, and he cuts his military cloak in half and gives the beggar half. And that night, he sees Christ in the dream wearing that half of the cloak. So that story was often told. And so here's him giving half his cloak, and he's a cripple, so it counts as visiting the, the sick as well. Then over here is a... A stranger, a pilgrim. We know he's a pilgrim because you can't see it, but there's a little shell on his head, a sign of a pilgrim. And he's being welcomed into an inn. And in the back, kind of controversial, uh, is Samson drinking from the spring coming from the jawbone of the ass. Remember, that was something we saw with some early Christian art. This, um, due to a mistranslation idea that there's water coming from this jawbone of an ass. And the controversy is, how is that a work of mercy? That's God giving him water. It's not, you know, somebody... Go but anyways, so he fits them all here in this one painting. Okay, and then lastly, uh, before we break, uh, we have a cycle of virtues. Uh, the virtues were especially from from early on, but especially in medieval thought about Christian ethics, started to become more prominent. It were, ver, thought about the virtues as an ancient tradition, but it, it develops in more intensely in the Middle Ages. So this is in Padua in Giotto's Arena Chapel. Uh, this is, it's filled with the life of Christ and Mary on the inside, and that's what it's famous for. But they're also included within it a cycle of seven virtues and seven vices represented the virtues by women. We won't look at the vices, too depressing. We'll just center on the virtues. So first, in the classical world, there were four virtues. Prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. And so the Christian tradition takes those four cardinal virtues and embraces them as well. So you have prudence, which in English now means being cautious or, you know, careful. Prudence traditionally meant 
No, knowing how to make good decisions on the spot, knowing what the right judgment to make is. And sometimes the right judgment could be kind of reckless almost. So that's prudence. Um, and you see prudence very carefully, kind of looking at a book, you know, thinking things through. What's the, what's the right moral judgment? There's justice, you know, holding scales, I'm going to be just to other people. Uh, here you have temperance. And temperance would have to do with, you know, uh, holding in check any excessive emotion or desire. Now, in the way that Giotto has set up the cycle of virtues and vices, he opposes temperance especially to wrath. So here he's thinking especially of holding anger in check. So um, temperance is wrapping a sword. I'm not going to use the sword to kill somebody. And she also, you, you can barely see it, has kind of a bridle in her mouth to keep her from misusing her tongue. And then here, you have fortitude, strength, courage, ready for a fight, whatever difficulties might come. And then, in Christian tradition, there are three theological virtues that are added that are distinctively Christian. The first is faith, the virtue of believing. And so here you have faith holding the cross and a scroll with the scriptures. And then you have hope and charity. Charity meaning love. Hope is hoping, here's a straining towards a crown, eternal life, towards good things. And then charity is receiving a fruit from Jesus, which he then is going to put in this basket of other fruit, which he will then give to others. So from God's love, then she has a reservoir of love to share with others and give to them what they need. Okay, so we will uh, pause there, but before we do, we have an important announcement about uh, something some of you might want to consider. Yeah, oh, sure. Uh, my name is Wei Shan Huang. I'm assistant professor in the Department of Cultural and Religious Study. As some of you might know, Professor Nicholas Lombardo is currently visiting our department as the visiting professor. He's teaching two courses in the MA program in Religious Study, and this public lecture series is one of them. If any of you in this room is interested in our program, I saw some faces of a professor uh, sitting in the audience. But if some of you are interested in our program, um, MA in Religious Study, coursework, scholarship, we have a prepared a, a pamphlet for you to take away. Or simply just visit our website, MA in Religious Study. That's all I need to say. Thank you for letting me be in the free rider tonight. Thank you. OK. OK. We'll get started with the second half. So the second half of tonight really is a kind of a distinct half. And um, we'll be looking mainly at the work of one, per, one figure, Georges Rouault, French painter, born in the late 1800s, died um, 1958. And in this part, we're going to just be looking at his work, and because what he has to say bears on this topic very much, but especially to bring in something that I has been kind of conspicuously absent from talking about Christian views of life and happiness is suffering, because suffering, of course, is also part of life, and Christian perspective has you know very definite ideas about this, understandings, traditions about this, and so it's especially. You know, with his help, we'll be looking at that topic. I deliberately left that out of the title because even I wouldn't want to hear myself speak about suffering. So I figured just keep it focused generically on life and happiness. So first, to connect this to another distinctive element of Christian teaching, which I have not talked about yet, the Beatitudes. So these are Beatitudes, eight promises of blessing that Jesus gives at the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. It's important uh, in looking at them to realize, and this is often missed, is that strictly speaking, these Beatitudes 
are not commandments. They're not obligations. They're promises. Blessed are those who blah, blah, blah. You know, if this applies to you, that applies to you. That will be given to you. And, um, and I think it's very helpful when thinking about the Beatitudes is to realize that all of them, in one way or another, are addressing how to find happiness or where happiness might be found in the midst of suffering. I mean, you don't need uh, a kind of uh, a guru to tell you that kind of all the good things of life will you know, be helpful to your happiness. But you do need someone who can point a way to finding happiness even in the midst of suffering. And the Beatitudes do do that. At least that's what they're purporting to do. And they themselves in this way are a cornerstone of Christian ethics. But again, not as commands, as pointing the way to something, but not as commands. Which is, they've often been understood that way in Christian tradition. And I think that's a mistake. So first, you know, just to go through some of these. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you are poor, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, that is, those who are humble, who don't push themselves around, for they will inherit the land. And notice, all these things, you know, are somehow related to deprivation, want, difficulties that we experience in life. Um, Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And why do we hunger and thirst for it? Why might someone? Because there's often great poverty of righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Why are they merciful? Because there's misery, which calls out for mercy. And so on. You know, go through these. But... Um, there's this element of the Beatitudes, and one of the reasons why Christians and non-Christians find these some of the most powerful sayings in the Gospels, because in a, in a very pithy uh, way, they address some of the most kind of dramatic aspects of life and its negativity, and find some positivity there. In, you know, that's Ma Matthew's version, Luke has an even more kind of stark version of the Beatitudes when he recounts them. Uh, it's, so blessed are you who are poor. Not poor in spirit. Just blessed are you who are poor. For the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are hungry. Not hunger and thirst for righteousness. Just hungry. You will be satisfied. Blessed are you who are weeping. For you will laugh. Blessed, and this is something they have both have in common, that blessed are when people hate you because of the Son of Man. And then, unlike in Matthew, then there's a series of woes. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are filled now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will grieve and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, and so on. So, uh, Georges Rouault, it struck me, as in his art, in many ways, you could say, in, looks at life with the spirit of the Beatitudes, with the kind of sharp realism that um, Van Gogh liked about Zola, but with, and his book, The Joy of Life, but with a hope that Zola didn't have in that novel. So this is just to see the man. This is him as an older man with his painting garb. And the first thing, before kind of plunging into Roo and his work, it's important to understand a little background where, you know, the kind of cultural environment he came from. He, in his, his origins of his artistic style is associated with symbolism, a movement especially associated with France, the late 1800s, 
And there's a lot of kind of vivid imagery, often kind of strange imagery, dreamlike, with very charged symbols that kind of, you look at them and they're charged with meaning by just powerful symbols, but often not in a clear way, but with an emotional charge to them. Uh, so here's, and it's, the titles are important because sometimes they tell you a lot about what it is. The dream. The crying spider. The garden of death. And you, some of them seem kind of, some of the works seem more kind of serious than others, you might say. This one is called Wounded Angel. It's a Finnish painting which is considered in Finland kind of one of their national paintings. And kind of this very well painted image of a kind of child angel who's wounded. I mean, how do angels get wounded? And, you know, one of them looking out kind of to the viewer. Death of the grave digger. So here's death kind of taking the soul of the grave digger. This is the same artist, Virgin of the Doves. Often in some of the symbolism uh, painters, they would often appeal to religious images, Christian images, uh, but often not because they themselves were religious, but because they're looking for charged symbols and uh, and they find them often in Christian imagery. This is the same artist, the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel coming to Mary to tell her that she's going to be the mother of God. So among the symbolists was Gustav Moreau, who was the teacher of Rouault. Rouault was from not a very wealthy background, and he ended up but he had a great love for art, and he ended up uh, getting accepted uh, to the Academy of Belle Art. And Moreau was one of his teachers. He was, one of his classmates was Matisse. Um, and uh, Rouault became one of Moreau's favorites. And in fact, Rouault was ended up entrusted with the Moreau Museum when Moreau died in the late 1800s. So here you're just kind of... Uh, kind of various charged images, often from pagan antiquity. Prometheus, the one who steals fire from the gods and now punished to have his liver eaten every day. A dead poet carried by a centaur. Story of Ulysses and the sirens trying to call him into the rocks. But like some of the other symbolists, Burrow will also turn to biblical images. So here's Jacob wrestling with the angel. Eve. Calvary. Christ on the Mount of Olives before his passion. A Pieta with the Mary and the dead Christ. So that's the kind of background that Ruo is coming from. And when you look at his early style, you see a very similar kind of feel, especially to his teacher, Moreau. Uh, this is the ordeal of Samson, figure from the Old Testament, kind of used as slave labor here for the Philistines. Uh, here is the child Jesus among the doctors. The story of when Jesus is lost in the temple and he's 12 years old. This rule won a big prize for in his time. But then something happened for Ruo. You know, up to this point, although he had been baptized as a Christian, he had never received his first communion. He was not religious. And, but he came across a book written by a French Catholic author, author a novel called La Femme Pauvre, The Woman Who Is Poor. And he read this book, and it changed his life. And he, from that point on, he became devoutly religious. 
And this, this figure, Leon Blois, the author of this book, was a big literary figure, but a very kind of unusual, eccentric person who could be kind of um, use kind of very acerbic and strong language with people. So he both had devoted admirers, and he had also people who you know, found him very difficult. And he himself in his life lived kind of on the outskirts of society, often in great poverty. But he had this effect on people. One of the stories about this, this figure, Leon Bly, I liked the most. Among the others who became religious because of him were two of the most famous Catholic thinkers of the 20th century, Jacques and Ray Samaritan. They did something which I think, is, I think of as very French. They were atheists and agnostics, and uh, they made a vow with each other that they were going to look for the meaning of life. And if at the end of one year they had not discovered the meaning of life, they would kill themselves. But fortunately for them and for us, uh, sometime during that year, they met Leon Bois, and their life went on another trajectory. So what happened with Rouault after this? Two things. One is his style changed, and his subject changed. He, uh, took, uh, he took on an interest in the poor and abandoned in Paris, where he was living. His subjects became prostitutes, clowns, circus performers, those who kind of were at the margin of society. And at one point he would write that his goal was to transfigure the most wretched subjects, the most terrible outcasts, and give them an odor or savor of the flowers of paradise. So this is his mature style. I mentioned he also uh, especially was attracted to circuses and clowns, both out of interest, but also in the contrast between their kind of happy faces and their actual lives. And at one point he tells a story about how he um, comes across a clown, an old clown, who's kind of taking off his... I'll, I'll read it. The, the old clown, seated on the right side of his trailer, mending his glittering and colorful costume, the contrast of brilliant, scintillating things made to amuse us and this life of infinite sadness. I clearly saw that the clown was me. It was us. This rich and spangled costume is given to us by life. We are all clowns, more or less. We all wear a spangled costume. But if we are caught unawares, as I surprise the old clown. This is another image of a clown. You notice how you know, it's just very simple shapes, strong colors. He manages to convey a lot through the eyes, in particular, of many of his figures. And one thing, apparently his grandfather made stained glass. And he often, his, his works have very strong black lines, which seems to be inspired by the black lines dividing stained glass windows to hold them together. Another circus, uh, some circus performers. This was a dwarf who performed in a circus. Now another interest that Rouault had, which makes me think of Luke's version of the Beatitudes, on the one hand he's particularly interested in the poor, the outcasts, but he's also interested in uh, as some of his subjects, those who are members of the elite, powerful, especially judges. So these are Three judges. This is titled A Box Seat in the Opera. 
This is the proud woman. And this is uh, one of uh, Baudelaire's inspirations, besides his, his religion, his faith, the scriptures, was, among other things, uh, Charles Baudelaire and his Fleur de Mal, The Flowers of Evil. He had a copy by his bedside. It was something he read every day. And at one point, he illustrated Baudelaire's Fleur de Mal. And um, this is one of the images from that. This is one of his most famous works called The Old King. And you kind of, it's, you know, one of his subjects into whom, you know, in a sense is he tends to be kind of viewing with a kind of critical lens, but you see his sympathy for the figure as well, the old king's weariness. Uh, he also, in addition to those subject matters, painted religious images as well. And at one point he said, my only ambition is to be able someday to paint a Christ so moving that those who see him will be converted. Now, when I, I, when I saw that, I, I think of uh, 10 plus years ago, there was an exhibit of Rouault's work in New York, and I went to see it with another priest. And while we were standing in line, uh, this, this old man came up to us and we were talking, and he said, you know, there's something about Rouault. I just keep getting drawn back to his images. And it's interesting that Rouault, if you, you know, almost any major art gallery in the world, anywhere, you will find, if there was a section on, you know, this period of art, they'll likely have at least one of Rouault's images. And he's one of the few kind of very explicitly religious painters of, of that period who you will find so frequently in, in galleries. So um, he, the face of Christ was a frequent subject of his images. And here I'm just going to go through a lot fairly quickly, give you a sense of them. And uh, in particular, this is, harkens back to the story of Veronica and her veil, that as he was going um, along the, the way of the cross, this woman comes up, wipes his face, and Christ's face then comes on the veil. Veronica just means true image. And so he, that story was, was a, a great inspiration for a lot of his art. So these are like the veil on which just the face is. So uh, here are some, some uh, images of, of, of Jesus and Nazareth. There's Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. This is another scene of Nazareth. This is the road to Emmaus when after Jesus' resurrection, he's walking to the town of Emmaus, and uh, he's talking with two of his disciples who don't realize it's him. So this is Christ among the doctors, which, if you remember, that was, that was his early version. That was his younger self, the one that won the big prize. And then that was when he returned to it many years later, how he painted it. This is Christ and the Pharisee doctor, one of his more famous images of Christ. And so here's the Pharisee doctor, Pharisee teacher, and Christ is touching him in a gesture of healing, and the Pharisee is kind of looking down, watching what's happened. And notably, the Pharisee it seems much healthier physically than Christ. Uh, another theme is he's interested in moments in the Passion. So here's the scourging of Jesus at the pillar. This is Jesus, you know, dressed up like a king. S same subject. 
face of Christ crowned with thorns. Then some crucifixions. This is an image of Veronica, the one who wipes Jesus' face. Now this is all to kind of lead to what many regard as his masterpiece, uh, a, a kind of um, a large art book of prints, black and white, called Miserere et Guerre, Lord Have Mercy and War. Miserere in Latin, Guerre in French. And in this, uh, this volume, there's it divided into two sections, miserere and guerre. And on one side, when you open a page, there will be the image, black and white, a print. And then the other side, a small phrase, which he chose. Some of them are from scripture. Some of them are from literature, either ancient or contemporary. Some of them are his own words that he puts to the image. And so what I'm going to do now is just go through some of them. And you know, this is just imagine. You're kind of turning the pages of a book. And one of the things that's striking as you go through this is how his subjects will often go from explicitly religious subjects to purely secular subjects. And um, how they kind of together give a different message, especially when you have the words on the sides. So this is the opening page. They're the head of Christ, the sun looking down. So it says, always scourged. This is something related, meaning in the sense that Jesus' scourging continues in those who suffer. So it says here, take refuge in your heart, you barefoot in misfortune. So here's somebody kind of encouraging a small child. Here's you know, somebody kind of holding their head, lonely in this life of pitfalls and malice. You're a king with a kind of uh, forced smile and just the caption, believing ourselves kings. And here you've got a small traveling group and the caption, at times the road is beautiful. Here, the hard work of living. A clown and the caption, who does not put on makeup? Depiction here of a town and small little family, mother, child, the caption, in the old district of long suffering. Then here, mother and child, it would be so sweet to love. And uh, something I forgot to mention is that um, he, he did this in the immediate aftermath of World War I. So that's the context in which he's doing this. So here you have uh, a, a blind man. Sometimes the blind have comforted those who see. So 
So this one has the caption, A Young Woman Called Joy. And there's a play on words in French, because one of the expressions for a prostitute is un fil de joie, a woman of joy, a girl of joy. So the contrast between the name and her reality. And then here, the upper class lady believes she holds a reserved seat in heaven. And then another image, probably a prostitute, in a mouth which once was fresh, the taste of bitterness. His lawyer, in empty phrases, claims his total unawareness. So again, part of his um, caricature of some in society. And now here is another image of Christ and a quote from one of the prophecies in Isaiah. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. And the order in which I've been going through things is more or less the way that you go through them in the book. I've taken some things out and but so you, get, you know, he's going back and forth between these different subjects. Here, uh, somebody sowing seed, and then the line, in so many different ways, the noble work of sowing in a hostile land. Street of the Lonely. Jean-Francois never sings Alleluia. Then you have a kind of a chapel with skulls and the line, he, a quote from the Gospels, he who believes in me, though he dies, yet he will live. And then sing matins. Matins is very prayer, early prayer, the earliest prayer of the day. A new day is born. And then a scene of the baptism of Jesus with John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit. And then a quote from Paul's letter to the Romans. Do you not know it is into his death that we have been baptized? And then a scene which is reminiscent of a gospel scene, but not quite from the gospels. So this is um, Rouault's own words. Lord, it is you, I know you, after, after the resurrection. And then the crucifixion with the caption, love one another. So that was miserere, and then there's the second part of it. It's all one thing, but it, you know, it's conceived of having these two separate sections. So this one is war. So this is the opening page where you've got the face of Christ, like Veronica's veil, which you saw is, is one of his favorite images, and then um, a kind of a soldier, kind of almost like skull-like soldier, with the line, the very ruins have been destroyed which I think is a quote from one of the prophets in the Old Testament speaking about Jerusalem. So here's close up on crucifixion. Jesus will be in agony until the end of the world. It's not, I, this is one I, I'm not sure, he's quoting someone, but I don't know who. He, he doesn't always indicate who he's quoting. So here's uh, a soldier going off, saying goodbye to his father. This will be the last time, dear father. But then this, the skeleton tells you it won't, he won't be coming back. 
This is a quote from a classic Roman author. Man is wolf to man. And then to kind of, you know, people who presumably were in a position to stop or start the war. This is one of my friend's favorite images. We are insane. Here one, you have face to face. So a figure looks like he might be a general, very well fed, and then it's almost like his mirror image, but who is starving, not well fed, and naked. Then mother and child, war so detested by mothers. So this is a, a striking, this is one I particularly tried to track down. And I think this might be something Rouault, uh, this is from Rouault. So it says, just the just man, like sandalwood, perfumes the ax that strikes him. Sandalwood, a wood that has a very strong smell. And like an ax hitting sandalwood, the just man gives a good scent to who strikes him. And so here's you know, somebody who's died being taken away, it seems, by an angel. And there's a mother and her child mourning him. And then the face of Christ. We'll see in some of these images, the face of Christ will be in the background, on the wall, a painting. Here, same thing, the face on the wall, a little brighter. There's a general and the comment, the nobler the heart, the less stiff the collar. Uh, so this is of, of the Virgin Mary, and according to tradition, she experienced seven sorrows in her life. You know, things like, you know, having to flee to Egypt to escape King Herod. Um, her son's crucifixion. So uh, the idea is that seven swords pierced her heart. So here's a sorrowful Mary because of those sorrows. And uh, now another uh, Marian child with a caption. In these dark times of vainglory and unbelief, Our Lady of the Ends of the Earth keeps watch. And then the last one, obedient unto death, death on the cross. Okay, that's it. So uh, we've got a little time for some questions. So questions? It's not easy to ask questions after looking at a lot of Rouault. I mean, it's something they can really kind of uh, think. Yes. Um, well, it, it's, it'd be, it's hard, I'd find it difficult to answer. It's a good question. I'd find it difficult to answer. One thing I can say um, is that when you say composition, you mean what's put in it or the style? Hmm. 
Um, I'd have to think more about that, but I think because of of Abraham and Isaac, uh, there's cl clearly some of the ways they're depicted, especially um, how much, what kind of background there is and so on, can you know, give a sense of, is this more of a kind of a spiritual take of the story that's less connected from the existential difficulty of being asked to kill your son? Whereas some other ones seem to be designed to bring that out more. The, 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 you know, the personal challenge of what he's been asked to do. But does that reflect the change in the philosophy of the time or the theologies of the thinkers of the different, um, um, like how the churches has been changing in the way that the teaching yes. Yes, I would say that there, there is that, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I could say specifically a composition, but in general, I think there's a move towards thinking more about the personal experience of Abraham um, in a more realistic and dramatic way. And that there is a, um, as that moves on, especially in the kind of the Renaissance onwards, that is moving towards a, um, a really giving much more centrality to what that means for Christian ethics. That's, that would be my interpretation of it. Sure. Yes. Um, I've heard, I, I don't know, but not much comes to mind. I can't think that he's a hugely common figure. Now, there is, out of one of the very earliest Christian sarcophagus, there is an image of Job. Um, he's put alongside, he's right underneath Abraham and Isaac. There's like eight panels on this sarcophagus. And there's, he's put right next to Abraham and Isaac for some reason. Um, so, but you know, now that you ask it, I don't know that he's been... I don't recall many depictions of him other than that one. That's the only one that comes to mind. It's kind of interesting. You know, part of it might be is that so many of the images are serving some devotional purpose. And since Job is, first of all, an Old Testament figure, and then not even Jewish, so he's not somebody you'd put in a church to pray to. Okay, so well, and, there, and uh, next week, uh, the topic is um, the apostles and the early church. <laughs>